everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. I know it's the end of like a long weekend, um, so happy to have you here. Um, so this is kind of the beginning of what I'm hoping is going to be a chapter in my dissertation. Um, and at this point, a lot of what I'm going to be going over today is kind of like a historical tracing of the figure of the roughneck and kind of some of the context um, of like the regional particularities that I'm working out of. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, so, following the crash of international crude oil prices and the resultant recession of Alberta's oil-dependent economy, um, the rate of suicide in Alberta has jumped over 30%. Um, this statistic is from 2015. Now, while large, largely tied by public health experts to the province-wide struggles felt from economic precarity, uh, the majority of these deaths were men, who also make up the bulk of oil field workers. And in actuality, the fallout of this crash has been a key session in which the position of men in Alberta's social and economic and political realms is in flux. So in this paper, I seek to ask whether the current spike in mental health crises amongst men in Alberta's oil and gas sector can be understood better as a crisis in kind of the conditions of masculinity rather than simply discussed as the result of a struggling economy. So I posit that understanding the figure of the roughneck as a regionally particular expression of hegemonic masculinity can better illuminate this current health trend as an effective response to an upheaval in gender relations and then can provide traction, possibly, for addressing mental health concerns, concerns that don't just rely on like, triaging economic symptoms. So, prologue. Um, so, filmed primarily in southern Alberta from October 2004 until August 2015, um, The Revenant, the movie, uh, recounts the incredible story of frontier guy Hugh Glass. Uh, during a mission to acquire furs for trade, Glass's group was attacked by an um, Arakara war party. Um, and while fleeing away, Glass was horrifically mauled by a grizzly bear and left behind by the majority of his, his companions. Um, he was left with a young officer and a trapper, and in the film, his half pawnee son, um, soon the trapper murdered his son in front of him, and he was left alone. Um, and what follows is this harrowing tale of masculine endurance through great pain, um, man overcoming nature, and the righteousness of avenging, of avenging grievous wrongs with violence. Um, so reminiscent of kind of classic cowboy films of earlier eras, and aptly congruent with the regionally particular version of contemporary Albertan uh, masculinity that I theorize is embodied in this figure of the roughneck. So at the same time that the revenant was filming in Alberta, the global, global market was flooded with surplus oil. So the causes for this flood were multiple. Um, surplus production from US uh, shale reserves because of frac fracking geopolitical rivalries amongst oil-producing nations, flagging demand from markets. A lot of that had to do with the deceleration of Chinese economy. Um, and also just a decline in the long-term demand uh, for oil following greater restraints due to uh, environmental legislation, right? So the world price of oil fell from around $125 US a barrel in 2012 to under $30 a barrel in January 2016. So for Alberta, a province whose very politics and culture have been deeply tied to oil production since about the 1940s, this turn was disastrous. So hundreds of thousands of jobs in the oil and gas sector, most of which were held by men, were lost. Um, and this shockwave spread throughout the rest of the province. Um, this newfound economic precarity was followed by political uncertainty um, when the historic ruling party of Alberta, the right-wing progressive conservative party, which is like a weird oxymoron name that I can't get enough of, um, fell out of favor. And this was largely due because the leader at the time, Jim Prentice, was trying to shift blame um, for his party's failure to diversify the economy over their like four decades of governments, uh, shift blame to the people of Alberta themselves, demanding that they should look in the mirror to understand the 2015 budget's shortfall. Um, shockingly, People didn't take this very well. Um, and it resulted in the historic election of a new Democratic Party majority. So for the first time in 44 years, um, the pro-oil PC party uh, no longer held a majority in Alberta government. And instead, the left-wing NDP party did. And they've since instituted a carbon tax and started channeling that revenue towards green energy. So kind of moving a little bit historically for a moment, um, the history of Alberta feels recent. It feels, when you're there, it feels recent. Um, since the quashing of the Northwest Rebellion, which is a 
features a greater part in my larger dissertation that also looks at the petroleum economy as an agent of settler colonialism. Um, since the quashing of the Northwest Rebellion in 1985 and the completion of the Canadian Pacific Railroad, along with the closing of the American frontier, settlers have streamed into Alberta. Um, it was popular, popularly figured as the last best West um, by Canadian immigration officials. And it was posited as a place where narratives of homesteading, rural living, and the romance of these pursuits were still possible. Um, forts and trading outposts were the epicenter of what would later become large cities, and images of rugged cowboy masculinity abounded. So here was a place where men could still be men, and hard work would just lead to abundance. Um, in 1923, the first Calgary Stampede was held, which was uh, celebrating the province's unique Western heritage. And on February 13, 1947, Leduc number no. one, um, an oil there, struck crude oil reserves and in Leduc. Um, and the trajectory of the province was changed forever, right? Billions of dollars were fueled, investment money was fueled in Calgary. Um, and the province's two major cities, Calgary and Edmonton, actually doubled in size over the next couple of years. So located just north of the strike, Edmonton, it would become the capital's province, uh, the province's capital. Um, very much an oil-based economy called the Gateway to the North. Um, and even larger oil reserves would solidify the province's status as one of the premier petroleum producers in the world. So with the establishment of this new oil and gas sector, a new version of regional masculinity evolved out of this figure of the cowboy, um, the roughneck. So while highly lucrative, the physical labor required to run oil rigs is dangerous and grueling. So drilling operations in Alberta are most often located in the north of the province, far from towns. Um, they're also subject to the harsh conditions of Alberta's northern climate. Um, you know, they're not so harsh when you're from there, but you know, we're in SoCal right now, it's a lot worse than rain. Um, <laughs> so these kind of Spartan camps exist predominantly for male workers who live well on hitches that can last anywhere from weeks to months. Um, major sacrifices are made. But the compensation is also significant. In 2013, the average salary for oil field workers, the majority of which do not have further education beyond maybe high school, oftentimes not even the completion of high school, um, was $130,000 per year. So roughnecking is a dangerous but very profitable vocation. Unfortunately, the conditions of employment don't really leave a lot of possibility for entertainment or maintaining healthy or stable relationships. So drug use and prostitution, while ostensibly are banned on camps, are rampant. So it is a particular kind of man who's able to withstand these harsh, harsh conditions. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so the roughneck prides himself on his work ethic, his physical and mental fortitude, and his social status as the backbone of the province's economy. So his labor is literally about making the, national, the natural world bend and submit to his will. Um, in the song, Rough as Neck Around, um, by Alberta folk singer Cord Lund, he valorizes the roughneck, saying, uh, well, his mind's a little tired, but his back is plenty strong, got his green kings and filthy frozen coveralls on, and he's driven by the inch, and he's hauling by the winch, taking fuel from the tanks on a short chain shift. You better hire him on, he's, rough, he's the roughest neck around, He's got the power in his hands to pull the dragons from the ground. So for the roughneck, oil extraction is akin to slaying dragons, right? So just another way that his masculine virility is ensuring that the continued existence and good times, to talk about the good life, um, of this province. So he also doesn't care about his outward appearance. And he's a decidedly blue-collar figure, regardless of his high salary, right? That's very important. So like the frontier cowboy before him, he's taming the edges of the wild and enabling the rest of his community to live this comfortable and happy life. So coupled with this hardworking, unshakable core of masculine forbearance is a level of raw, performative bravado that's signaled by the accessorizing aesthetic of the roughneck. So jack pickup trucks, um, often worth, worth more than many Albertans in other vocations make per year, um, are commonplace on great sites. So in fact, like, the higher lifted, the louder, the better. Um, in case the masculine symbolism of these vehicles is lost on the casual observer, many of them are also adorned with truck nuts. Um, literally a human scrotum, complete with testicles, truck nuts hang up from uh, the truck's tow hitch and unmistakably mark the vehicle's owner as aggressively hypermasculine and overtly sexual. These are everywhere. 
Like, this is not just, it was describing as a Chinook, so warm coastal winds come over the Rocky Mountains. Um, they're very common and very welcome in Alberta in the middle of terrible cold winters. Now, his ignorance of this local phenomenon, coupled with his righteous progno prognosticating about the province's economic reliance on oil, um, and how the province was contrib contributing to these factors, uh, earned him censure across Alberta's political lines. So the right-wing news site, the Red Wing Media, um, mocked him as a liberal dumbass, while even Dr. Adam Leach, who's an associate professor and academic director of energy programs at the OA at the University of Alberta, as well as the chair of Alberta's climate change panel, cheekily tweeted that, I can assure you that acting on the recommendations of the climate change panel will not prevent Chinooks. Like, don't worry, we're not trying to take the Chinooks away, bye. Um, so, <coughs> moonlighting Hollywood stars, though, are not the only threat to, roughnecks, to the Roughnecks legitimacy um, that have entered Alberta's socio-political sphere over the, over the years. Um, with the new Democratic Party's victory in 2015 community premier, Rachel Notley. Um, so this picture here, so she's the, I'm gonna speak extemporaneously for a bit so I can get it quicker. Um, she's the second premier that Alberta has ever had. Her predecessor, Alison Redford, was the leader of the PC party um, who got into a lot of financial trouble, mostly for taking a private jet to Nelson Mandela's funeral. Um, which, again, was not very popular with conservatives around there. Um, and she ended up being forced by her caucus out of government, mostly because the party, party whip commented that she's not the kind of person he'd like to get a beer with. Right? So you see, you see like, the, the limits of like, filial party protection here. Um, women in politics, not treated so well in Alberta. Rachel Notley also committed a bit of a gaffe while she was appearing at the Calgary Stampede, taking a symbolic pledge to uphold Western values. Unfortunately, at this time, she put her cowboy hat on backwards. There was lots of pictures taken of it. Um, and she was widely, widely criticized for this, right? Like, how can she be a leader if she doesn't even know how to put her, her cowboy hat on the right way? She also instituted this wildly unpopular, <laughs> this wildly unpopular carbon tax. Um, and is there, she's diversifying the economy so as to prevent further economic collapse in the future, right? But um, she, she doesn't embody roughneck values, right? So this largely male public outrage over not this failure to appropriately embody roughneckness um, is a defensive reaction to kind of the effective vulnerability, vulnerability of having masculine hegemony threatened. Um, so I engaged here with Michael Kimmel's term, uh, aggrieved entitlement, to describe the way that mostly white working class men have responded to these dual forces of greater social equity and also economic precarity that have kind of decentered their, their demographic. Do I just stop? Time is up. Okay. Da, da, da. Aggrieved entitlement, da, 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 da. perceived wrongs. Right, perceived wrongs, whether they, they have actually happened or not, fuel like kind of these dual affects of like violence and rage, mostly because like the subject position of hegemonic masculinity doesn't allow access to other emotions to kind of process these things. Um, it's my contention that these harming vectors are being rebounded back on men themselves in Alberta as kind of a defensive move to assuage the threat of um, of like their position getting shattered. Um, da, da, da. So in this, this I again am borrowing from Kimmel and call this kind of effective evaluation wind chill effect. So it's a reference to how like things like humidity or wind chill affect the perception of temperature. So the con this concept is especially salient for looking at this um, because just saying the words economic recovery in Alberta puts people on the defensive, and there's this palpable tension in the province when it talks to the fact that, that the recession has mostly ended. By a, all objective measures, it's over. So after two painful years of contraction, um, Alberta is now expected to lead the country in GDP growth again. Um, and latest important employment data says that um, the province gained 26,000 jobs in December, December, most of them full time, and more people are employed now than before the crash. Um, but still, you like utter the word recovery, and it just doesn't feel right. Right? And because it's not strictly speaking what's happening, right? So the re word recovery, recover, implies like this reclamation of something that was lost, but it's just not what's happening in Alberta. Yes, the GDP and unemployment have returned to pre-crash pre -crash levels, but it's a different structure.
structure to the economy, right? So it feels different wind chill. These jobs are mostly white collar and urban and have required the acquisition of new skills, which the provincial government has largely funded, by the way. So economic recovery has not alleviated the rage or mental health crisis because this recovery doesn't feel like recovery. Um, uh, survival necessitates adaptation. Masculinity is always in crisis. <laughs> uh, Hugh Glass survives and crawls back from the bear attack, but then like ends up dying anyway, trying to quest for revenge. So the end. Woo!